Welcome to our first set of notes in Unit 6, which is the unit on learning and how human behavior is changed. So the first set of notes is going to surround classical conditioning. Let's first talk about what this word conditioning means, and you should write this somewhere in the margin or up at the top of your notes so you understand, because there's multiple types of conditioning. Think of, if you're an athlete, for instance, think of what it means to go to conditioning or to condition your body, right? You're working out you're getting your body physically prepared for the sport that you play. You're conditioning your muscles. If you are conditioning your hair, right, you're treating it, you're changing it, you're making it more healthy, I guess you could say. Well, in this instance with learning classical conditioning, and we're gonna describe this more throughout the notes, <clears throat> is a way to change behavior using unlearned stimulus and responses, so naturally occurring stimuli and responses. So let's talk about, let's kind of backtrack and talk about learning. It's a relatively permanent change in an organism's behavior due to some kind of experience that they've had. Here's the thing, if behavior doesn't change, the organism then hasn't learned. So if you are sitting in class and your behavior, which is also your like understanding, your cognitive understanding of what's going on, if you, if that doesn't change, then you haven't learned the information. It's, it's as simple as that. So how do we learn? We learn by making associations, right? If you associate yourself with someone, you are somehow linked to them, right? So it's kind of like a linking. So our minds naturally connect events or associate events that occur in sequence, one after the other. Aristotle, 2,000 years ago, suggested this law of association. Then 200 years ago, Locke and um, Hume reiterated this law. So there's stimulus to stimulus learning. So it's a learning to associate one stimuli with another. And this is what classical conditioning is. Make sure you understand this because this is where the association is made, which is what makes it different from operant conditioning, which we're going to discuss next. So you have two related events. For instance, one stimulus is lightning, okay? And the second stimulus is thunder, right? And that happens over and over again. You see lightning, you hear thunder. You see lightning, you hear thunder. The result after repetition, the stimulus is we see lightning. We respond to the lightning. We wince anticipating the thunder, right? We have associated lightning with thunder. So every time we see thunder or uh, see lightning, even though it in and of itself is not necessarily scary, we still kind of are like, oh, oh, here it comes, right? We are associating the thunder and the lightning, and therefore we respond to the lightning. So ideas of classical conditioning originate from old philosophical theories, um, but it was, however, a Russian physiologist, not a psychologist, not a research psychologist, but a physiologist, Ivan Pavlov, who exposed classical conditioning to the world. Um, so in classical conditioning, he was one who kind of realized learning occurs when a neutral stimulus, meaning a stimulus that does not elicit any response, comes to bring about a response after it is paired with a stimulus that naturally brings about a response. And Ivan Pavlov came about this when he was using dogs in his laboratory, okay? So he had, you know, I'm sure multiple dogs in cages lined up and there's all kinds of laws surrounding treating and taking care of the dogs, right? Well, he learned that as they were taking the food to the dogs, or he observed, I should say, that the dogs were salivating before they even got their bowl of food. Now, why does a dog or any organism who consumes with their mouth, why do we salivate? Well, it's to help break down the food, right? So what he learned is the dog is associating the process of, you know, the person bringing the food to them, maybe the food in the bowl, that noise, or um, just seeing the bowl of food. They're associating that with the food itself, and therefore they're responding without the food. And he's like, wow think of what we could do with this. And he coined it as classical conditioning. So a few things to remember before we really get into this whole classical conditioning here. An unconditioned stimulus leads to an unconditioned response. Let's really quickly define unconditioned, and you should write this in, your, in the margin of your notes really quickly. Unconditioned means naturally existing. You could also say that it means unlearned, 
but that just means we don't know anything, right? Or it, 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 we don't understand how to respond. Well, we do, but it's because it naturally exists. So if someone like flicks you and you go, ow, or you flinch, right? That's a natural response. Just like salivating when you have food in your mouth for a dog, that's a natural response. So an unconditioned stimulus, the item causing the response, leads to the unconditioned response. So unconditioned, again, means unlearned or untrained. I also, I kind of prefer naturally existing. Conditioned then means learned or trained, okay? In that it's not natural, but we have, through association, learned to respond to a certain stimulus. During conditioning, a previously neutral stimulus is transformed into the conditioned stimulus. So like thunder, or I'm sorry, lightning, that we don't hear lightning until a while after. It's a neutral stimulus, but it becomes the conditioned stimulus. 99.9% .9 of the time, the neutral stimulus becomes the conditioned stimulus. The unconditioned response and conditioned response are similar, if not the same. Okay, so maybe in the first one, it's the unconditioned response is pain, and then the conditioned response becomes like anxiety about the pain, okay, or, or, or cringing because of the pain. That's, that's kind of similar. They're very similar. And then the stimulus is the thing, right? It's what elicits the response. Make sure you write that down. It's what elicits the response or causes the response, and then the response is the reaction. It's our behavior in response to the stimulus. So Pavlov's experiment, he was not a psychologist, but instead a physiologist trying to understand the di digestive process. This is actually what he won a Nobel Prize for. Um, when he stumbled upon classical conditioning, his actual research was going awry because the dogs were salivating before the food was put in their mouths. Kind of interesting, so he kind of like started putting the puzzle pieces together. So in his experiment, this was before conditioning, okay? Food is the unconditioned stimulus. Now think to yourself, why is food an unconditioned stimulus, an unlearned or naturally existing stimulus? Well, it's because it's naturally existing. It naturally produces salivation. Okay, so then salivation, I mean salivating, right? Um, is the unconditioned response. And notice the abbreviations here, UCS. Sometimes it's just US and then UCR or UR for unconditioned stimulus and response. So then he pairs the food with the neutral stimulus, which is the bell. When you ring a bell at a dog, it does not make them salivate, right? It might make them turn their heads or bark at it or something. Um, but it's not making them salivate. So it is a neutral stimulus because initially they do not respond to it. Just a quick sidebar, you might want to put this in the margin and circle it. Um, it actually was not a ringing bell, it was a tuning fork in Pavlov's experiment. So if you were to ever see a test, a test question that said tuning fork, don't let that throw you off. It's essentially the same thing. Um, but again, the neutral stimulus does not produce a response. So during conditioning, they take the tone, the tuning fork or the bell, the neutral stimulus, and the food, the unconditioned stimulus, and then they pair them, resulting in the UCR. Here's the thing. They did the bell, they rang the bell, gave the dog food. Rang the bell, gave the dog food. Rang the bell, gave the dog food. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. They pair the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus neutral times, numerous, I'm sorry, numerous times to condition the dog, to teach the dog the natural reflex of salivating. They just pair, want to make it go with the bell. Here's the thing. Remember, this is stimulus to stimulus learning. So we are pairing the two stimuli, the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, the bell and the food. That's what we're pairing in order to make the dog salivate to the bell. Another note to make is that the neutral stimulus always comes like a split second before or precedes the unconditioned stimulus. Make sure you write that down. The neutral stimulus precedes the unconditioned stimulus or comes before the unconditioned stimulus, but just a split second. It's not a bell and then half an hour later the food. It's bell food, bell food. It's very quick. 
So here's what I want you to do. Use Pavlov's dog's research to fill in the lines below. You have this on the guided notes that I provide you. You can also do it on a loose leaf sheet of paper. <clears throat> I want you to fill in what each component of classical conditioning with Pavlov's dogs would be. So the unconditioned stimulus that's given for you, unconditioned stimulus is the, is the food. So when you give dog, a dog a food, what happens? The unconditioned response is salivation. Okay. So then the neutral stimulus that does not elicit a response would be the bell. So take the NS and just drop it down, that's the neutral stimulus. Take the UCS, drop it down, that's the food. Take the UCR, that's salivating, and drop it down, that's the UCR. Okay, so they, this is just showing you the process of NS, UCS creates the CR, UCR. Okay, so bell, food, salivating. So what ends up happening when they no longer present the food, the conditioned stimulus is the bell. Remember, the neutral stimulus becomes the conditioned stimulus. So that when they ring the bell, the dog salivates. So again, when they ring the bell, the conditioned stimulus, the dog salivates, that's the conditioned response, conditioning has occurred. Let's give you another example here, and I want you to fill this one out on your own. Every time someone flushes a toilet in your house, the shower becomes very hot and causes the person in the shower to jump back. So eventually, um, what's going to happen is that every time the toilet flushes, the person's going to jump back from the water, right? So here's the thing, what naturally makes someone jump back? That would be the unconditioned stimulus, right? That would be the hot water. So the unconditioned response is jumping back or even maybe the pain of the hot water. The neutral stimulus that does not create a response at first is the flushing of the toilet. Like no one responds by jumping back from a toilet when it's flushed, right? So just drop each of those three components down. So then every time toilet flushes, hot water. Toilet flushes, hot water. It probably only takes like two times for you to get it. So that the conditioned stimulus is the toilet flushing and your conditioned response is jumping back from the water in the shower. Some other examples of classical conditioning that you might see in your everyday life is the bell ringing to end a class, right? We're, we're not just like robots that stand up because a bell rings, right? We have associated that the bell means it's time to go to our next class. The unconditioned, unconditioned stimulus being it is time to go to your next class. So the response is you get up and go. But we've associated the bell with the end of class. So we just react to the bell. Um, advertisements using attractive people to sell products, right? Um, and that we're making the association between the attractive person and the product that they're trying to sell. Our response is, ooh, I, I wanna get that, right? It's naturally occurring associations. And then anxiety when we hear the sound of a dentist drill, if you're someone who's afraid of like the dentist or that pain or have had any tooth problems. 